I have a confession to make. But before that, I want you to make a confession to me. I want you to raise your hand if you believe the way you're handling data in your organization is very, very efficient. Efficiency is a subjective term, right? Let's put it against some numbers, some facts, because we're data people, right? Let's say you're trying to ingest new data set from the time that you start your connection to your source till you get your data in through different layers of transformation, till you get it to different environments and you're testing and you make it available in production to your consumers. The whole process takes you only a few hours. I want you to raise your hand if you believe the way you're handling your data is very, very efficient. Not many, right? What about moderate efficiency? Let's say this whole process takes you only a couple of days. Still no one. How about not efficient at all? Anything that takes you more than two days, it's considered as not efficient at all. And that's what I think where the industry is. Thank you for being honest with me. I also have a confession. I am not a data engineer. In fact, I don't have the skill set that you guys have in the actual data engineering. But what I'm really good at is helping data teams to become very, very efficient. I always say this to my client. I want you to develop fast. I want you to move fast and move with confidence. Because you don't want to keep moving fast and falling and tripping. You want to move fast and you want to move with confidence. Believing whatever you've done, it's not going to fail. Hi everyone, my name is Aina Maleki and I'm a technical principal at a consultancy firm in Perth called Mechanical Rock. I, a bit of background about myself, I'm a software engineer by nature. I've done a lot of app development, a lot of front-end, back-end, infrastructure as code, DevOps and automations. But in the past two to three years, I've been involved in data area, helping clients to build data platforms on Snowflake, on Databricks, helping to set up security patterns. But the main thing has been helping clients to move fast with their data. And that's what I'm here today. I'm going to be talking about how to bring software engineering rigor into data. Things that I was doing in building software that was helping us to move fast and move with confidence, I'm going to tell you how to apply them in data. I always say this to my client. You have to think of it as building a software application because it's no different. In software application development, you build some business logic, some functions, right? You give it an input, you expect an output. Same thing in data. You write some transformation logic, you give it input data, expect that output data and then you have to deploy it, and then you have to test it, push it to production. Same thing in data, right? But I also contradict myself. I also say it's not the same thing. The main difference that I see in data engineering and software application is the fact that if your software application fails, it's a lot easier, a lot less at stake. You push small changes, trunk-based development, small changes to production. If it fails, you cause an incident, you revert it back. Nothing <coughs> happens, right? You get your production application healthy. What about data? Data is often in the middle, and we have so many consumers. We have our business people, we have our reports, we have our machine learning models, we have our third-party applications consuming the data that we generate. And imagine, what happens if you push the wrong data? If you push bad data, you go to your CEO and knock his door and say, hey, that report that I sent you last week, it was wrong. I messed it up. We actually didn't make money, we lost money. Do the same thing to your machine learning model. Say, you've been trained for the past three months with good data, but I made a change and I messed it up. Past week, whatever have you've learned, 
remove it, unlearn it. Maybe you can. I'm not a data scientist, I don't know. Maybe you can research your machine learning models. But what I'm trying to say is it's really, really hard. And it's very expensive to clean your bad data from your production. Same with your third party applications. And that's why I always say testing is way more important than you think in data. Because it allows you to move with confidence. And that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that the transformation that we push, the logic that we push, it's not going to break anything. It's not going to generate bad data. When I started my journey in data, I was researching, because at Mechanical Rock, we do a lot of automated testing, a lot of unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end testing. So I was trying to do the same thing in data. I was Googling, researching, going to meetups, asking people, how do you do your automated testing? All I was hearing is, we do data quality checks. I was like, what? Data quality checks. Great expectation testing. DBT testing. They're all the same thing. It says, the specific column that I've got, data coming in, make sure that's unique. Or make sure the data that comes into other column matches the specific regex. But is that enough? Is that enough to give us confidence that the business logic that we've written, it's not going to fail? No, it's not. There are different ways of testing in data. Uh, data quality checks, gaps checking, querying random batches of data, testing your input and output. But what I love is black box testing. This is my input, this is my expected output. Take it through the transformation, does it match? Who has heard of Dora Metrics? Raise your hand if you've heard of Dora Metrics. Okay, good, few people. DevOps research and assessment team, they're a team backed by Google. They've done six years of study to identify four key metrics that allows the software development team to move fast, that identifies the performance of a software development team. What are those metrics? Deployment frequency. How many times do you deploy to production? Lead time for a change. From the time that you push your change until you push it to the different environment, until you do you run it through your testing and push it to your, your production, how long this process takes? That's called lead time. Change failure rate. How often does the change that you push cause a failure? And time to restore service. From the time that something fails, until you know about it, until you figure out where it's broken, until you push a fix, that's called time to restore. Does this apply to data? Yes or no? Yes, it does, right? Because we still do the same thing. We still deploy code to production. We still make failures. The data pipelines that we create, it fails, and it needs to be as stable. Same thing applies. Dora team, they say you're an elite or high-performing team if you're high-performing across all four metrics because they correlate. You can't be high-performing in deployment frequency, constantly push changes without testing and then cause your change failure rate to go up or your time to restore to go up. So you have to be an elite team in all of those metrics. So they say, deployment frequency, you're an elite or high performing team if you at least push more than once a day to production. Where do you think we are? Raise your hand if you think we're elite or high performing data teams as an industry. This is where I think, because there's no data, it's my opinion. There's nothing online. I think from all the clients that I've seen, all the people that I've talked to in the data industry, I think we're in high or medium. We make changes to production. For new changes, new transformations, we make them quick. But then existing code. If you have an existing transformation made by someone else, two years ago, they left the company, some report is using it, and if that breaks, people start yelling at us. We're scared touching that. We don't make changes to it often. 
What about lead time? From the time that you commit your change to production, I actually think it's okay. We're not doing bad. For wrong reasons though, because we don't do enough testing. Well, I haven't seen much automated testing in the industry and not even manual testing much in data. If you're not doing manual testing, well, you're fast. Just go straight to production. You don't even go to any other environments. Time to restore service. That's where I think we're really bad as an industry. I really think between one day to one week or more than that. When some data pipelines fail, it takes a long time to restore it and to fix it. And failure change rate, change failure rate. Again, I've heard that everywhere. Our data pipelines are not stable. Our data is untrustworthy. And that's because it keeps failing. Anything more than 15% of change failure rate, you're a low performing team. Dorothy, they have created these reports called Accelerated State of DevOps. Per year, they generate that report. 2021, they say, an elite performers, in comparison to low performers, they have 973 times more frequent code deployments to production. 973 times. And in terms of their lead time, they're, they're 6,570 times faster to push their change to production. And 6,570 times faster to restore from a failure, from an incident. Now, if you think we're low performing in data, you can see where we can become if we become an elite team, right? So how do we become an elite data team? What's the thing that we can do to become a high performing data team, right? I, in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna take you through five failure points that I've seen it happening over and over in the industry. And five strategies or principles that if you follow them, you can scale and you can become fast moving teams. Failure number, point number one, slow moving data teams. What do you mean by that? Slow moving platforms actually. You might be familiar with this. This is taken from Data Mesh. Who knows about Data Mesh? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, that's what I was expecting. A lot of people in data, they know about what data mesh is. For decades and years, they had these data platforms in the center and physical resources. We had data producers pushing data into it. We had our consumers accessing data from that centralized platform. But we identified our physical resources are not scalable. They're not able to keep up with demand, and they're not scalable. So what we did was, we pushed them into cloud. Cloud is scalable, right? It's elastic. So we thought that's gonna help us to move faster. But it's not. We still have slow moving data platforms. Why is that happening? Because those data teams, they're often managed and controls, controlled by decentralized data teams. They're the ones who maintain the platform. Anything going into the data platform has to go through that central team. Anything going out of the platform has to go through that central team. And it's not fast. Or even worse, those central data teams, they do the whole thing of grabbing data, transforming it, pushing the data out. Grabbing more data, transforming it, pushing it out. Now think about enterprise level. Now, how many data pipelines they have to build and surface? What happens if you build something? Who maintains it? Yourself, right? Now, if you're a central team and you build so many data pipelines, you have to maintain all of them. And then it fails. 
because it always does. Don't tell me like I've built a data pipeline that never fails because it does. Our systems are evolving, our data are evolving. So our data pipelines fail and you have to maintain them. And then I often see the central team, they're constantly firefighting. They're constantly trying to be under pressure because of all the things that fail, and because of all the requests that they get, because of all the demands that they get. And that's not scalable. Our people are not scalable. Doesn't matter how many people you put in the middle, it's still not scalable. So how do we fix this? You need to start decentralizing your data engineering teams. If you already have a central data team, think about decentralizing them. They have to be embedded within each domain and business units. And that's what the data mesh tells you. Data mesh tells you that each domain, they have to do their own ingestion, they have to do their own processing, and their own serving of data. Does that mean that everyone does their own thing and then we get inconsistency in our platforms? No. There are still centralized pieces, and that's called the governance, the controls, the platform consistency. Those bits are centralized. But the actual data engineering, ingestion, processing, serving the data has to be domain's responsibility. So you need to start separating what's centralized, what's not. What is the platform responsibility? What is the domain's responsibility? This is from data mesh architecture. It tells you domain is in the middle. That bit is domain's responsibility, creating data products ingesting, serving. But the platform responsibility is policy automation, monitoring, access management, cataloging, storage and query engine. We've got a guild over there that look after the governance and rules and policy. They create the policies, but data platform team automate it. And then there's an enable team, enabling team that helps the domain with good practices, with documentations, with how to get started, helping the domains to get started with the platform. If you want to think about different responsibilities, that's what I think the platform should do. Enabling the domains. What do I mean by that? I'm a domain, I want to get started with the platform. I need a few things. I need a database, I need a role, I need grants, I need access controls. All of those things, have to be created for the domain to, for them to get started. Because we don't want to give admin access to the domain so they can do whatever they want. We want to have platform consistency and good RBAC architecture. So they control within the platform. Centralized access layer, consistency, auditing, and platform building templates, which I'm going to talk about later. But domains, they're responsible for ingesting data, transforming data, serving their data, observability on their data pipelines, automated testing on their data pipelines, and data masking and PII removal. Why data masking? Because they're the business owners, they're data owners, they know about their data. They're the best people to know what to remove and what not to remove, what's sensitive and what, what's not. You still think domains and platforms, okay? There's still coupling. When there's couplings between the teams, you can't move fast, right? So how do we remove this coupling between the two to allow the domains to go fast, to not needing to engage another team to do something for them in order to get started? The only way that you can move fast is by automating your platform responsibilities by creating a self-served automated platforms. And that takes me to my second failure point. What I see is in data platforms teams, we don't often have enough capability. The capability required to automate things and to move fast. To build a strong platform team, you need to combine your capabilities. You need to combine your people Bring people with strong DevOps and automation capability 
I mix them up. I told you, I'm not a data engineer. I'm a DevOps engineer. I'm good at DevOps and automation, but I've learned data engineering working with other data engineers in the platform teams. I teach them DevOps and automation. They teach me data engineering. It works. We combine our skill sets and our capabilities in order to build a fully self-served automated platforms. And that's the only way you can move fast and you can scale fast. Another failure point, slow platform adoptions by domains. The domains, they don't want to take responsibilities. They don't want to do more work. They don't understand data engineering. So how do we convince them to take on their own data engineering? You build it, you run it, you maintain it. You also take care of your own data. How do we do that? By automating domain capabilities to allow easy adoption. Remember the thing that I said about building templates? Platforms, one of their responsibilities is building templates. So close your eyes. I'm honest, close your eyes. Imagine, I'm a domain. I go to this self-serve, fully automated platform. I fill out my form. Could be a dashboard, could be a bot, could be anything. I fill out the form, my naming convention, name of data owners, details, and then press submit. Now automatically, I get everything that I need. I get all the resources that I need to get started. I get a pre-template GitHub repository with automated deployment built into it, with automated testing built into it, with automated CI CD built into it. Everything, it's ready for me to get started. It's sample SQL transformations and sample testing. All I need to do is just changing that SQL. Say, this is my table name, this is my source, writing my SQL transformation. So you know how easy to, that becomes for them? They don't have to understand the integration, the plugging, the setup. It's all set up and ready for them. Ta-da, it's magic. Now they can go fast. Now they can adopt it really fast. Failure point number four. Overprotective data teams. I see it all the time. They're like, our data is sensitive. We don't want to give access to anyone. We're scared. So what we do is we hide it. And then what happens, our data becomes undiscoverable. And then what happens when your data is undiscoverable? You create multiple copies of the data, the same data. It's not there, so I think it's not there. I'll replicate it again. So how do we fix this issue? I had one client, it was hilarious, I swear to God. They had their testing, QA, in all different environments. But they're like, we don't give anyone access to any of those environments. We've created per domain, but we don't give them access. Because we're scared they will build production data into their QA database or test database. What? You can't stop people from being dumb. All you can do is to detect it, right? What happened? So strategy number four, build security and data discoverability into the platform. Because you're the platform team, you give the domains everything that they need, including pre-built, predefined roles, access controls, everything. So you set up data discoverability and security already built in. And it's consistent for every domain. Instead of protecting your data and hiding it, assume Everything is safe. Assume all data are non-sensitive, unless the domain defines it. Unless the domain team, they say this data is sensitive. You're like, what? That's lack of security. We don't want to stay, we don't want our state, the sensitive data being leaked. Well, how do you fix that? By 
detective approach instead of protective approach. So instead of hiding your data, detect the ones that are being leaked. There's a lot of testing tools. It goes and checks for sensitive data in your databases and gives you a report. Automate those. Like for example, Alation does that. Plug into Alation API or any other tools that you want. Get and run it through all of your data and define uh, and identify the sensitive data that hasn't been masked or hasn't been removed. And then what you do? Remove them, hide them. It all happens automatically, right? So we protect our data and then the domains, we teach them from the start, you need to protect your sensitive data, otherwise we're gonna delete it. Otherwise, it's gonna go missing automatically. So they learn to do the right thing from the very start, rather than us, being overprotective. Failure point number five, cluster of mess. I see it over and over. You might have seen it in, even in your organization. This is an example, but true story. There's a report that we need, and this is our source database. In the past, we had a some material job transforming data, pushing it into Redshift. But that data is required for this report. And we don't know what's going on here, so we're scared of deleting it. At some point, we also pulled DMS to push the data into S3 bucket. And then God knows what this glue job is doing, but it's pushing some data into Redshift that we need. And then at some point, we thought Cladero was a good thing. So we would like that like on top of our S3 bucket. And we also did some proof of concept with Databricks. We put DBT on the ECS that keeps going out of memory. And we also plugged that data into our report. Now imagine, one of these lines break. What happens? You get bad data in your report. You get missing data in your report, right? And then we thought, our problems are our tools. Let's just try something different. Maybe Redshift is not good. Let's go with Fivetran. Fivetran is SaaS product, right? You don't have to maintain infrastructure. It's scalable, it's good. Snowflake, SaaS again. I don't have to maintain infrastructure. Let's go with that. And who doesn't love DBT? We all love DBT. And then we hate Jinja, right? So we put DBT in there. But what people don't realize is it's another mess added to the top. So we create more mess and more mess. Unless you clean this, they all exist together. And we're too scared of cleaning because we don't know what's gonna break, because we don't have enough observability, enough testing. I honestly have seen this. Even companies, they're doing the right thing. They don't have this mess. They use only one data warehouse, tools and technology. And they're doing ELT, good, extract load and then transform on top. But they still have mess inside that one data warehouse. Everyone doing their own thing, there's like lack of security, things are messy, things keep failing, inconsistency. Why is that happening? Because we don't do it right first time. And that's what I say, build it once, and build it right. Spend enough time to build it right. Build the right infrastructure, build the right architecture, build the right security controls from the very start to allow you to move fast, to give you the confidence, to give you con consistency. Unless you do it right, you'll be in the same situation. Again and again and again. Tools are not our problems. There are heaps of tools out there. The way of doing things are our problems. But good things take time. What are you telling me? You're telling me to change team topologies. You're telling me to just bring and hire DevOps engineers. They're too hard. That's not my job. I'm a data engineer. What do I do? Like that's management decisions. Now, start small. Start small with the things that you can do right now. 
use Git for the love of God. If you're not using a version control, already use it. Because I've seen it. I've seen us going, manually changing things inside a data warehouse. Oh my God, that's, that's hard to debug. Other people won't know what we've done. And we create more errors. Don't do that. Just plug it to a version control. Set up automated deployments. So everything is consistently being deployed and pushed, and it's fast. Add automated testing. Data quality checks are not enough. Add enough automated testing to give you confidence to move fast. And separate platform administration from your data pipelines. So if you think data mesh is a good thing, if you believe in it, if you want to go with that pattern, start with separating at least your business logics. Separate whatever is required for platform administration from your data pipelines. And then when you start separating your codes and business logic, then you can start thinking of handing some of those over to the domains. And start capturing data about health of your data pipelines. The only way to be able to improve is to know where you are right now. It's really easy. Dora metrics that I talked about, mean time to recovery, mean time between failures. Those things are really easy to capture on your data pipelines. And we're data people, right? When you capture data about your data, how stable is the thing that you build? How often does it fail? And remove your administration access again for the love of God. <laughs> because you're a data engineer, it doesn't mean that you should have admin access. It literally doesn't. No one needs admin access. What needs admin access is my service user that is connected to your automated pipeline that I can push high privileged actions. Not myself. I don't need admin. No one does. Here are some of the references. We've got a blog on um, Snowflake data ops. We use a lot of Snowflake in Make Rock. If you guys are interested in how to set up automated pipeline, it's really easy to do that with AWS. There are some other blog posts about Dora, about Data Mesh, and these two books are highly recommended. They talk about the same concept, data management and scale. It talks about domain data, domain data driven design, which is similar to Data Mesh. Highly recommend them, read them. There are some Data Mesh books I think out there in the sponsor desk. And yeah, call us if you have any issues. We have helped a lot of clients in Mechanical Rock to set up data mesh, to go fast, to scale. If you have any questions, come and talk to myself or Hamish from Mechanical Rock. We're happy to answer any other questions. Thank you very much. Hi, all. I've got a booming enough voice so everyone can hear me. That's all right. Um, I, I was curious to know, I, I love data mesh, it's a great, concept and framework. I'm curious to know whether you've seen that successfully applied anywhere. Yes, yes. Um, not fully implemented because it's a long journey. Um, it takes a lot to migrate everything in an everything way that we're working. But, but with one of the clients, they've, they're almost there. They've started separating their business domains and setting up the centralized platform administrations. And each of the domain, they're doing their own ingestion and transformations. Another client, we're helping them to get there. I think, yes, I have seen it. It's possible. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a question. You had that diagram with the Wild West of all the different services and people doing whatever. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that become even worse in a data mesh framework when each of the teams is potentially doing their own thing again? So how do you, what are your thoughts on that and, and how does that work in a distributed way? Yeah, I often say this, control the things that are important and let go of the things that are not important. If the domain is deciding, like for example, we're creating templates for the domain as, as a template and pattern for them to get started fast. But if they want to go their own way, let them do. Why does it matter? They maintain it, they take care of it, they're responsible for it, not me. And as long as that domain knows how to maintain it, it doesn't matter what tools or technology they're using for their transformation. And even if they want to do things manually, 
I don't suggest it. I don't do anything manually. But if they want to do that, it's their responsibility to maintain and take care of it. Let them do. So I want to say, I always say, control the things that matters. Security, access control, high level consistency. But then inside it, tools and technologies that they want to use, it's up to them. Thank you. The team is distributed in the different team, the data engineering different, mm -hmm. embedded in some software engineering team, where mm -hmm. a lot of software engineer. Mm -hmm. How will the report line generally work in that case? As reporting management? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I think it will be part of that domain reporting. So each of the data engineers, they will have a different report line. Yeah. It doesn't have to be centralized. So the report line doesn't have to be centralized as no. well. Okay. Uh, yeah. A little bit similar to the previous question. So on this diagram, your work starts on the left, right? The, the database seems to be the sort of starting point of your pipeline. Data bricks? Oh, no, the database on the left, right? Oh, yeah, That's yeah. your source. Yeah, and, yeah. and obviously, there could be multiple different types of databases and multiple yeah. databases in one domain, and there could be streams, yeah. etc. But but often data pipelines fail or they produce the wrong result because there are upstream changes. Yeah. And you talked about coupling before, and you know you'd probably say just make it the problem of the business domain people. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you solve that problem where let's say the team deploying the website or the you know web services or whatever they deploy like multiple times a day, mm -hmm. which often leads to inconsistencies in the source data, and then the team building the data transformation has to sort of catch up and build a pipeline that can interpret all the different ways the data was generated in the past. It's yeah. How do you, I guess, skill up the domain people and get them to change their way of addressing that? I think data mesh was really good with that because you bring the data engineering and make it problem of the domain. So software engineers, that they build the application, they also help with the data. So when they help with the data, they understand the pain. They understand just, for God's sake, add a, add a date column in your tables. They understand why we need that. And then they start thinking in advance the things that they should take care of if they're making a change. And they do the whole process. So what I'm saying is like, if, if it's a domain problem, then they know about what's going on, go, what's going on in the data area. So they're being more mindful of the things that breaks our sites. So they build their softwares in a way that. I, I think helps. that that would absolutely be ideal. But do you see pushback where they say, "But hey, you're slowing us down. We can't deploy as many changes as frequently because now we have to worry about the downstream stuff as well." I think it's a contract, right? So the place that I worked with. The software engineering team, they also take care of pushing the data into S3 bucket. And then there's versioning and there's things. So if they have a breaking change, they make sure that like, you know, it's a new version. So it's a contract between what's the upstream of what you're connecting and the data being pushed. And if it's all within one domain, it's a lot more manageable than being centralized. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thank you for the wonderful uh, presentation. It was really informative. My question is with regards to uh, data mesh. So as you mentioned, it's for each domain, you have separate pipeline uh, for in data mesh. Uh, wouldn't there be challenges with regards to how you manage uh, to upskill the uh, data engineers? Because each of them would have to understand each domain's understanding. And also the second question, um, if each domain looks after their own infrastructure or ecosystem. What if there is cross dependencies and how to manage them? What do you mean by cross dependency? As in, um, there might be some reports which are cross dependent. So one domain and other domain, they may overlap at certain point mm -hmm. in the pipeline to, mm -hmm. uh, to give the report, uh, unique report. So how do we manage that? Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, so in terms of cross-dependency, it's similar to how we work right now. We create data products, and then we create versions of data products. And there are consumers like analysts using specific versions, right? So same thing in the domains. When they maintain, manage creating that data products, they also have to make sure that they do it in a way that it doesn't break down streams. So their data products is consumed by themselves as well as other business domains, and as well as like reports that we need, like for example, cross domains. 
And what was your first question? <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 upscaling, upscaling. Um, I think it's easier. <laughs> As being in the centralized theme, you need to know the business domain of every domain and data about every domain. If you're only working in one area, it's a lot easier. You only need to know the business logic of that specific domain and data of that specific domain rather than knowing everything. Yeah. Hey. Hey, um, so what are some of the other big um, ideas or um, best practices in software engineering that you see moving into data engineering? I think for now, like the, the one that I see a lot is DevOps automations and creating templates and patterns. Because I see a lot of repetitions in data, in data engineering, we're doing the same thing over and over, like connecting to source, we're deduplicating, we're transforming the data. Why can't we create templates and patterns? And uh, yeah, so far that's the thing that I, I, I spend a lot of my time investigating. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Zainab, so much. We're conscious of the time, and we would like to move to the next speaker. Uh, thank you very much.